The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everybody here in the UK, and uh, good afternoon to everybody in China, and hello to everybody in between. Uh, I would like to welcome you all this morning to our webinar uh, hosted by the China Britain Business Council and kindly supported by NJ Akers and Greg Latchams. This morning we're going to be talking about legal strategies for the healthcare life science sector. So without further ado, just a little bit of housekeeping, if you could kindly um, raise your hands to make sure that I can uh, see that everybody is listening to this broadcast right now, that would be appreciated. Perfect, I can see that. Can I, can I kindly ask all attendees, please, to mute their microphones, because at the moment there is a little bit of um, some background noise, so that would be, that would be most appreciated. Thank you. Just a little introduction to the China Britain Business Council for those that are not aware of the work and role that we play. China is complex and we help to simplify it. We are the largest UK China business community with around 600 members. We've got staff here in the UK and an extensive network in China of 13 offices. We offer sector specific advice, support and services for UK companies looking to trade, uh, enter, expand their sales in the Chinese market. We also work bilaterally, supporting Chinese organizations looking to invest and work in the UK and in third markets. We deliver a lot of events and reports over the course of the year, and we offer bespoke research and solutions for our clients. At the bottom of the slide, you will see the stakeholders that we work with to support British businesses. Just very, very briefly from me this morning, because what we want to hear is how do companies best organize themselves and be legally diligent within the sector. A quick snapshot, obviously the elephant in the room is COVID-19, which has had and inevitably will have a huge impact on UK companies' ability to trade, not just with China, but obviously with all uh, export markets and not forgetting their own domestic businesses. But we can only look to the opportunities and COVID-19 certainly will present significant opportunities for UK businesses within the healthcare and life sciences sector looking to trade to uh, trade, sorry, and export to China. The golden era 2.0, well documented, but the facts speak for themselves. Last year, exports to China, specifically within goods, increased by just under £6 billion. UK imports also increased. China is now the UK's fifth largest export market. And that is reflective as well within healthcare life sciences, where we're seeing significant activity by UK businesses across the patient pathway, be it from uh, hospital design, um, architecture, uh, medical devices, biotech, pharmaceutical services around training, uh, commercial businesses working there, NHS trusts working there. So the opportunities really are uh, very, very broad. Look to policy in China. Policy means action. Healthy China 2030. Uh, a significant policy update from the Chinese government in 2016, essentially outlining healthcare as a priority for China and the government. It involves reform and innovation, scientific development, justice and equity. Please do read this. Um, this indicates a, a hugely growing sector. We all know the numbers, but specifically, uh, the desire on the Chinese side to work collaboratively with UK partners to develop solutions that bring knowledge and innovation, something which UK healthcare sector is globally recognised as being an expert leader in and none more so than in China. 
What are the challenges? The challenges are ongoing urban and rural disparity, an increasingly aging population, a rising burden of non-communicable diseases, the opportunities, continued improvement of living standards, rising household incomes. Both of these combine to provide an ideal match for China's national healthcare objectives and with what the UK can offer. It is at this point that I would like to introduce our first speaker this morning, Graham McCallum from NJ Acres and Co. Graham is a partner in the business and is somebody that is an expert on IP uh, IP related issues. He works with a significant of number of UK companies and organisations, specifically supporting their interests and due diligence with regards to the Chinese market. So without further ado, Graham, I am going to now make you the presenter and I welcome uh, your presentation. So thank you very, very much. Thank you, Jamie, for that introduction. Um, and let me just start the slideshow. I would also like to say at this point that if anybody has any questions for any of the panelists at any point, please do not hesitate to type them in the box. What we're trying to do this morning is make this as interactive as possible. So if you have any questions for Graham, Graham will be answering them immediately after his presentation. And likewise, once Paul Hardman joins towards the second half of the presentation, he will also be answering, uh, answering any questions you may have. So please feel free to pop a question into that box at any point. Uh, Graham, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Um, so protecting your Chinese business and for my section of the presentation, I'd like to um, look specifically at the intellectual property, the IP considerations. Um, during this part of the presentation, I would like to cover, first of all, the IP landscape in China, have a look at IP assets and contrast the differences between uh, the Chinese systems and European UK systems have a brief look at some IP risks that you might encounter in China, and then finish off with uh, a summarizing um, strategy that you should be considering for your IP in China. Um, so first of all, the IP landscape. Typically, China has a reputation for IP theft, for counterfeiting and copying, other companies' products, and there's a, a reputation or a, that, that has a reputation that courts favour Chinese nationals as well, and that's very difficult to get um, decisions in your favour for outside foreign companies. However, the reality um, is that China has been come over the, recently, over the last few years, much more conscious of its reputation overseas. And recently, there have been substantial changes in the IP laws um, to make it more of a um, level playing field in China. And also, the courts have become more neutral. So it's now also easier to have decisions enforced. Perhaps 20 years ago, you could get a decision in your favour, but then you would have real problems trying to enforce it on the ground. Um, and that may be because of there were reasons, things like the person who owned the factory you were trying to close down was the cousin of the mayor or the cousin of the police chief or something like that. But this... Um, sort of uh, these sorts of problems have definitely diminished and it is now much easier to have decisions enforced in China. Now bad faith activity um, especially on the filing of trademarks is now being um, heavily discouraged by the Chinese government and there, are, uh, there were steps taken at the end of last year to um, further strengthen the law to in China the trademark law to try and um, discourage bad faith activity. Innovation is now actively encouraged, so China definitely sees itself as an innovative um, uh, hotbed um, rather than just copying and counterfeiting. And this 
is reflected to a large extent that China is now the largest filer of international PCT patent applications. Um, I think at the end of last year, it overtook the US for the number of PCT patent applications filed. Um, there are now also specialist IP courts in Beijing, Guangzhou and Shanghai, and there are 19 IP tribunals which specialize in technology related IP lawsuits and these IP tribunals are spread throughout the country. So looking first of all at IP assets and patents, generally the patent system in China is harmonized with other major countries and um, it's probably closer to the UK European system than the US system is. Um, the patentability standard is very similar to Europe. Um, so, for example, uh, methods of treatment and diagnosis are prohibited. Um, and for pharmaceutical claims, um, Swiss type claims are permitted. Um, so, this is slightly different from Europe, but if you have um, second medical use claims in, U in Europe and then you convert into a Chinese patent application, you can at that point change the claims from the European style of second medical use into um, the Swiss type claims that are permitted in China. So the Swiss type claims um, typically um, are in the form of, for the first medical use, the use of compound X for the manufacture of a medicament, or for the second medical use, the use of a compound X for the manufacture of a medicament for the treatment of Y. Software patentability in China is very similar to Europe, uh, and that may be relevant if you're if you've got um for example diagnostic hardware or other sorts of hardware that is controlled by software um sufficiency of disclosure um typically china has a much th higher threshold for sufficiency of disclosure than the uk and the epo um and particularly for chemical and pharma inventions. Often with chemical and pharma inventions in Europe or just generally chemical inventions, you can um, later file supplemental data after the application has been filed. That's not currently permitted in China, but there is a proposal uh, with an amendment um, to the Chinese Patents Act. Um, not sure, it's unclear when that's going to come into effect, but there's a proposal to uh, make bring this more into line with the UK and Europe and allow the later filing of supplemental data. In China, there's also a patent term extension that's being proposed, um, which um, based on our, our understanding, this would be similar to SPCs in the UK and Europe and would last for up to five years with a maximum of 14 years from the product approval. Utility models. Uh, this is not something, an aspect of IP protection that we have in the UK, but it is available in China. Um, it's like a lower level of patent application. It tends to be quicker and less expensive to get a utility model granted, but the protection is less. The protection is only 10 years versus 20 years for a patent application, and only involves formality examination. Um, the inventive step threshold for utility models is also lower. However, utility models can only be used for devices, so unfortunately you can't cover chemical compositions, formulations in utility models, and no methods or processes. And the utility models can be filed simultaneously with a patent application. So when you go into China, you can file both a utility model and a patent application. And there are a number of reasons why you might want to do that. So for example, it would give you filing a utility model simultaneously with your patent application would give you protection under the utility model while your patent application is going through examination. And if for any reason your patent application is refused or you decide to abandon it, you would still have the utility model protection in China. 
And this tends to be a strategy um, that is underused by foreign companies in China, um, but it is something that you can do, and it might be particularly relevant for um, for high value cases where or cases where you feel perhaps that you're not sure whether the how patentable the invention is, there might be question marks over it, then there might be easier to get utility model. Trademarks. Um, China is very definitely a first to file country for trademarks. So um, it's not generally sufficient to just use a trademark in China. You to get rights there, in order to get rights in China, you have to file a trademark application. So this makes it um, incredibly important in China to file early. And ideally, you want to file before you enter the Chinese market. There has been a lot of publicity um, over the years about um, Chinese companies filing trademark applications in bad faith. And um, as I mentioned earlier, the bad faith provisions and Chinese trademark law have recently been strengthened towards the end of last year to discourage such activity. Um, and it's now less likely, um, the courts are less likely to favour Chinese companies. Um, it's much more neutral than it used to be. Um, so, for example, just last week, we got a decision in our favour against a Chinese company on a trademark matter. We were acting for a UK company that was trying to get its trademark registered in China. Its trademark application was being blocked by an existing Chinese registration, which we didn't believe the Chinese trademark registration had been used. We filed a cancellation action to have it removed because it hadn't been used. Uh, uh, the proprietor of the Chinese trademark registration filed evidence um, that it had been used. We argued to the court that the evidence um, wasn't real evidence, that it had just been fabricated, and there was nothing to support that the evidence had been genuine. And the court came down in our favour and has cancelled the Chinese trademark registration, thereby permitting our application to proceed. And also on trademarks, if you don't file your trademark application in China, inevitably someone else will. And so you need to think as well, if you're not going to file, can you afford not to be able to use your mark in China? Designs. Um, designs in China must be registered. So unlike the UK and Europe, there's no unregistered design rights. Uh, also, China has no grace period. So in the UK and Europe, you can manufacture and sell your product for up to a year before you decide to file a design registration. Um, you can't do that in China. So if you're thinking about protection in China, then your first registered design application, whether it's in the UK, Europe or China, must be filed before there is any non-confidential disclosure of the registered design. In China, the length of protection of designs is less, so it's only 10 years versus 25 years in the UK and Europe. Um, and also, you cannot protect parts of articles unless these are sold separately. Copyright. Um, copyright in China, there is a registration system, so consider registering in China. It helps to prove ownership and it helps to prove the date of existence of the copyright material. However, it is pub public record. So for, con for materials which are confidential, you may want to reevaluate whether it's appropriate to register in China. And this applies to things like, for example, software. So software in China, like the UK and Europe, is covered by copyright protection, but it may not be um, strategically wise to register it in China because there is the potential there to actually put it on public record um, where and that you know obviously would disclose your software. Confidential information typically covers trade secrets and know-how uh, and um, as many of you are aware when you're disclosing that sort of information especially with regard to new products it's, it's good practice to use written non-disclosure agreements, NDAs, or confidentiality agreements, and especially in China. Um, the advice in China would be definitely use written NDAs. Make it clear to whoever you're disclosing the information to in China that they um, 
that they are under a confidentiality obligation to keep the information secret. So IP risks, one of the biggest IP risks in China is trade fairs. And they're known to inspire infringers. So if you're attending a trade fair, consider avoiding showcasing important know-how and information on your stand. Um, don't allow photos on your stand. And some companies at trade fairs will also restrict access to the stand as well. So just finishing off with some pointers on IP strategy to consider for China. First of all, I think the most important thing is to start early and plan ahead. Understand as well what your IP assets are and what the risks are going into China. So if you're not sure what all the IP assets are in your business, then ask your patent attorney to review the business um, and make sure you know what you've got there that's valuable. Think about can you afford not to own or use your IP in China and what you can uh, what you can do to ensure that you can own and use your IP. Also consider what others will want to do. Sometimes what others will want to do, the aspects of your products that others will want to copy may be, may be the most valuable parts of the product and think about protecting these aspects. Identify and protect your IP before you go into China. So to do all this before you go into China, make sure you've got ducks in the row, do your due diligence and minimize the risk to your IP when you do go in. And lastly, learn from other exper others' experiences. There's a lot of people out there who are already active in China and a lot of them have a lot of experiences of doing business in China. Not all the experiences are good. Um, a lot of people have tripped up, but learn from their mistakes and try not to do the same thing. So that the end of my presentation um, uh, and now if there's any questions Jamie thank you Graham at the moment we don't have any questions uh, if anybody does want to uh, put in a question at any point as I said please do so um, for the time being Graham I think we can move I think we can move over to Paul and um, Yes, and then obviously we can answer any questions at the uh, at the end. Okay, so I'll just pass the control of the presentation over to Paul of Greg Blatchams, and passing over to you now, Paul. Can I just kindly remind everybody, please, to uh, just 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 to mute their microphones, please? There was a little bit of background noise there. Um, thank you. Um, Paul, uh, Paul, thank you very much. Um, do appreciate um, you also uh, supporting this webinar this morning. Paul Hardman is the director for head of corporate and commercial at Greg Latchams. So, Paul, uh, please do take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, I'm just going to sort out the presentation. Let me just do that a minute. Um, just can you see? Can anyone? Can you, Jamie? Can you just tell me whether you can see my screen? I can't actually see. We, we, yeah, we can. We can see your screen, Paul. We can see that the reminder, um, your toolbar, and everything. Just can't see the the presentation at the moment. Okay. It's, the thing is, I've got two screens, and I think the problem I've got is which one are you seeing? So let me just flip this up a minute. <clears throat> yeah, we can now see, Paul, your uh, presentation. If you could make it enlarge, that would be um, that would be brilliant. Very good. Thank you. 
Uh, just, just, just quickly, Paul, before you, um, before you jump in, but Graham, we've we've had a question through. Um, how long from when a trademark application is submitted do the Chinese authorities take to make a decision on whether the trademark can be registered or not? Um, thank you, Jamie. It used to be that it was typically twelve to eighteen months. But recently, in the last two or three years, that time has come down, and we're now seeing um, decisions or examination reports from the Chinese Trademark Registry within about six to 12 months. Um, and assuming there are no problems, you would expect it to, to proceed to registration within about three to six months after that. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. Um, but of course, sorry, Jamie, I was just going to add, but of course, the important thing to remember is that um, the important bit is, the, is your filing date. So when do you actually file the application? Because that gives you um, the sets the date in terms of priority over other applications that are filed subsequently. OK, there's been actually a follow up question here, Graham, that says not approval, but decision on whether the trademark is OK. Yeah, so that would be normally in the examination report, which we would get somewhere between six to 12 months. OK, fine. Perfect. Um, Paul, thank you. At the moment, we can also see the black surround to your presentation. Are you able to make it a bit larger, please? Perfect. I'm going to show you, hopefully, that is now a clean copy of the slide. Yeah, that's clean. Just sorry, chaps, everybody on the pre on the webinar, please do mute your microphones. We can still hear some background noise. Uh, just click the unmute yourself button on the panel. Thank you. Paul, please do take it away. So, yeah, good morning. Thank you very much, Jamie. I'm going to talk to you about contract stage protection and due diligence. Um, the commentary I'm providing uh, this morning is from, from a perspective of uh, an English law perspective a specialist uh, working with Chinese law counterparts. Um, uh, these are three important areas for early consideration when planning, and this presentation is a selective look at those three areas. Um, we have worked with uh, CBBC, and last year uh, we did we ran a masterclass uh, of four morning sessions uh, uh, over each of those. Um, something in the order of two to three hours. So you'll appreciate this is a brief look at these uh, important areas. So the, the first area we're going to look at is contracts. Um, one of the very first things that you will come across as you venture into China is how do you approach this difficult issue? The background of the individuals and their heritage will affect the negotiations and what i certainly found uh, is that the older age group in china um, won't have grown up uh, with the ideas that we have uh, just subsumed into our uh, cultural heritage around the sanctity of private contract in the uk and the development of the concepts that we have around private property both real and intellectual over many years um, if we compare the, the Chinese um, experience, uh, it's really they've had a relatively recent and galloping pace of development of those private rights, uh, rights and all of those are within what I would call a state franchise. Uh, sufficient to say that the state, in effect, gives permission for businesses to carry on their business, and that's really important as we go through these slides, you will see the role of the state is, uh, it's always there, uh, I would say, in the background. So <clears throat> they can affect the look and terms of the contract. Um, Chinese contracts tend to be more based on spirit and intention than on detail. If you like, if you've ever done business in Europe and you've dealt with, uh, in particular, say the French approach, you'll see that they're, they're not long on detail. It's very much about uh, writing something in fairly loose terms, as we would see it, and uh, creating a, an understanding from there. 
Whereas I think the English approach is very much more around being very specific around the detail and working out uh, one of the things that we do as English lawyers is work out the what ifs. What if that if that happens or, or the other thing happens? That isn't something that uh, Chinese uh, businesses tend to go in for. So a lot of patience required and good translators um, to work between the English and the Chinese. And uh, certainly in my experience, that isn't, you do not want a literal translator at this point if you're negotiating a contract. You need somebody who understands business, understands your business, understands what you want to achieve, and is able to convey those ideas in Chinese uh, with their counterparts. Uh, or obviously, ideally, you'll be working within a common language, uh, hopefully, um, if, if you're a, like me, a non-Chinese speaker in English. How, is the, how does this affect the, the contract, the way it's treated within the overall and ongoing relationship? Well, I just comment that uh, there's li liberal use within um, China of MOUs, that's uh, Memoranda of Understanding. And MOUs are non-binding typically, and uh, they set the context of a relationship which is yet to develop. A lot of people will comment, and you will hear this, that MOUs are not worth the paper they're written on. That may well be the case, uh, but they are a starting point and they are a, an expression of intention on which it is possible to build. But um, the comment would be made that a, a contract is just a stepping stone in a relationship. Now, that is true, if you think about that, from an English perspective as well. Um, how strong is the sanctity of that contract? And you do get the comment that the Chinese don't regard it as particularly uh, a, a framework, an absolute framework within which they must uh, work. That is also in part true, but I think attitudes are changing. And certainly I think take, uh, uh, my recommendation would be to take an English law approach to these things. If you regarded the contract uh, as having sanctity, then you, you will have a much better chance of establishing that as the ground rules going forward. Um, <clears throat> some points about negotiating positions, um, really largely based on the experience that, uh, that, that I have had and my firm has had working in China over, over six or so years. The Chinese like to buy the best and the reason for that, in part anyway, is bragging rights. Um, and this isn't just about the size of the deal, but the cleverness of the technology or the pedigree and typically the age and brand uh, that, they, that they are buying. And the bragging rights associated with being able to um, uh, look their family in the eye and say they've done a great deal. They like to see the price up front and then choose what I call the supermarket test. And this was a very good piece of advice given to me early on going into China. Think of it as walking into a supermarket and, and seeing all the options and everything being priced up. That is how they like to, uh, to, to, uh, to um, come to the negotiating table. So go prepared for that. Um, government likes to see Chinese companies to, to buy to fill a gap in capacity or knowledge. So China is no longer the cheap workshop of the world, but a world power and the place of innovation and invention, as Jamie's policy notes at the beginning of these slides demonstrated, the government looks over the shoulder of business, as I've explained, and business is aware that they are being looked over. So you will find that um, they will want uh, the deal that they are doing with you. In the background, they will want to know that, that they will get official sanction if it comes to that. The choice of law is a key determinant early on of negotiating power. But, you know, and your answer therefore might be, well, we've got some very clever technology and we think English law should apply. Um, I would caution, uh, uh, this is perhaps not what I would normally advise were I uh, say negotiating cross-border within Europe, but um, recognize who you're dealing with, in other words, the cultural context as explained above, the opportunity in front of you, and Jamie's gone into some of that, 
and the enforceability of contracts under English law. And Graham has also uh, alluded to changing uh, the changes there. Now, uh, if you choose English law, the Chinese courts tend to, or will, look at the English understanding, uh, uh, the English law understanding, and uh, they will, it will take some time to go through the process of uh, understanding exactly what the English law means, and therefore it is likely to slow down the process. So the advice for the moment, and it is changing under new these new foreign investment laws, the advice at the moment is to go with Chinese law and, and Chinese language documentation to get a better chance of enforceability locally. Preparatory steps. Um, Graham has talked about the value of information and the use of an NDA. We're going <coughs> recommending a bit further, which is that uh, you have something called an NNN, which is a non-disclosure, non-use uh, and non-circumvention agreement. Um, there are, uh, this will give you restrictions uh, around use and that you cannot be cut out of uh, the loop. They can't go, the, the, your Chinese counterpart will agree not to go behind your back. The problem with restrictions on disclosure uh, is that they may not address the cultural context. Um, that is to say, uh, Chinese businesses will typically regard group companies as being all within one disclosure group and perhaps even subcontractors for whom, uh, you know, who will be doing part of, say, the project is equally people to, with whom uh, they must share the information. And therefore, you get, you get um, perhaps inadvertently, uh, leakage of confidential information. <clears throat> Local regulatory compliance is going to be key for any uh, medical device or medical um, healthcare uh, um, the service you're going to be providing and you will need to find a, a local agent to do that. So uh, a little later on these slides I'll talk a little, a, a, little, a little bit further about finding how you might do that and the importance of your local agent. Um, in terms of these preparatory steps you might also look at structuring which is considering how are you going to get your product out there and that could be through a distributor or through your own um, wholly foreign owned enterprise, your WIFI. Uh, you might think about tax and taking professional advisor, advice around that and repatriation of gains. Again, it's a changing landscape there with repatriation of gains, capital gains and income gains, uh, income profits. Um, the, the changing landscape is freeing up um, what was a fairly restricted uh, regime. So very much a question of taking uh, advice if you're going, if you're going in as a medical institution, um, be aware that you will be on a negative list, and that is to say, uh, restricted how you come into China. And uh, a joint venture is the only way that you will uh, find a, um, a a way to set up in China. And I've given you there a definition of medical uh, institution. And perhaps I'll just say at this point that this uh, law around this area is is very fresh off the page. And a lot of these things are based on uh, guidance uh, that's been issued, policy statements that have been issued and not yet been put into hard and fast law. So um, some of these definitions you'll find in my slides are suggestions from uh, those guidance and policy uh, um, documentation. So moving on to data protection, I thought I'd just have a look at this um, from a comparative point of view, i.e. how does it compare to um, what, what we have in the UK? So uh, certainly personal data and sensitive personal data is covered. And, uh, you know, that actually is, it's, it's, it's something we, we will, you will, we're reasonably familiar with here. Um, if you look at the definitions, and I've, I've, I've dotted those around this page, so you've got them there. Um, they, the personal the definition of personal data the, the essence of that is uh, identification of a natural person or reflect the activities of a natural person, so slightly broader uh, than the UK equivalent. Um, you've got sensitive data, which uh, again is not too far removed from what we would, uh, how, how we would understand that phrase. Um, and specifically, uh, you will note the, um, the, the caution about um, children uh, under the age of 14 years. 
So within personal data or censored personal data, I think you'll find medical data, definitely patient and medical prescription records, customer data, and employee data. But the uh, Chinese laws go further than that area. They, they actually talk about something called important data. And um, this really brought it to, to, to light in a case I've just been dealing with for a, a pharmacy dispensing company and the importance of understanding what uh, uh, patient uh, patterns will tell you. So and this is an area which is uh, currently caught or could be caught uh, under Chinese law under this definition of important data. And I, again, I've, I've put the definition there of what that uh, is looking like. So um, unlike uh, our, our own rules, um, important data, big data and informatics um, could be caught by uh, Chinese data protection rules. You've also got another complete branch of, uh, of, 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 of law which could affect data, and that's, the, that's, that's security laws. So um, this would be particular, particularly important if you're dealing with a, a Chinese state-owned enterprise, an SOE. So uh, I just thought I'd give you some uh, policies, uh, scene setting around the policies that, the, that China is adopting regard to data um, and some concepts really. Data, data localization, as you'll see, is storing data in country and that's a guiding principle when it comes to medical data and a positive obligation rather than the data export restrictions. Um, so we're familiar with some of these concepts, but the difference is the state's involvement and the control. The terminology is different. There is no uh, direct equivalent to this data localization. And uh, we talk about export, whereas uh, at least the Chinese would talk about export, whereas we talk about data transfer from controller to processor or from processor to controller where it is possible under our laws to transit without processing, processing or intention to process. Um, and you would not transgress UK laws. That, that isn't the case if we're talking about data export, where as you'll see there, um, that can include uh, storing in a server outside China or granting access to foreign entity or a of, of a server in China. In other words, um, it's not the concept of controller and processor. Uh, it's around, has that data moved out of China? We also have this concept of uh, cyber sovereignty, and I've touched on that. Uh, so uh, as, you'll, as I've said before, this can affect big data. So the, the watchword there, and this affects can affect you even if you haven't got uh, a presence in China or even if you do have a presence in China and you think you've safely anchored all the activities within that organization, be aware that if you are seen by the Chinese authorities as data manager and controller, that can affect you uh, even in those circumstances um, if you're offshore. So, as you would imagine, the usual rules we would expect for someone handling personal data apply in China, but they must be checked for compliance in the local setting. So you'll see uh, the way that uh, data is collected, processed and exported all needs to be uh, um, uh, properly documented and demonstrated. The, the breach can be uh, swinging, the rules there, not just in financial terms, but for the operator organization and also for the person directly in charge. And as you'll see, um, not just financial, but the punishments can include closing down the website, revoking relevant business permits and revoking the business license. So definitely one to get right. Export controls, a little bit more uh, about that. Um, essentially, you've got this obligation to keep your data in China 
and not to export it. So one of the circumstances where you can export it, well, key to that is making sure you have data subject consent. And when you're collecting data, it's absolutely essential, therefore, that you get that consent. The uh, obtaining of that consent explicitly is regarded as the only safe way of proceeding in these circumstances. And certainly, if you're dealing with sensitive information or information relating to children, um, that must be uh, explicit. And uh, as I said in, in the slide, in relation to children, it has to be given by a child's guardian. When you're making an assessment of whether or not you should or can export that data, um, if you are the network operator, you can make that assessment. If, you don't, if you're not the network operator, obviously you have to approach the network operator, providing you uh, satisfy the 500,000 data subjects rule at the bottom of the slide there. The assessment will be based on whether or not the data subject is given consent, whether or not the export may damage public or national interest, whether or not export may endanger security or national policies, and the et cetera refers to territory, military, eco economy, technology, culture, society, information, ecological environment, resources, nuclear facilities, and so on. And there may be other CAC prohibited circumstances. Anything over 500,000 uh, data subjects has to go to the CAC who will make the assessment on the same basis. Um, a final word on um, this area, and that affects uh, critical information infrastructure operators. So again, this is an emerging picture. Uh, the law is developing fast and is emerging from policy papers and guidance, not necessarily into detailed binding laws. But, you wouldn't want to fall on the wrong side of non-binding guidance. And the watchword, of course, is tread carefully. Um, there's no fixed definition of the CII, but it, it appears that it could apply in the healthcare and life sciences sector. The government wants to learn from the data, particularly as it comes to terms with its dem demographics and tries to build a healthcare system centrally that would address the needs of its increasingly affluent society as Jamie's slides uh, illustrated. But in extremis, the Chinese government does want to control the story. So if you fall into this category, and you will need to work out whether you, quite carefully whether you do or not, there will be stronger security obligations, stronger do data localization requirements, export only after assessment, and bigger fines. A final word on data exclusivity and clinical trials. Um, so the policy background to this is that China realized that its then policy on clinical trials meant that um, drugs uh, which were freely available within the rest of the world were very slowly coming onto the China market. And that was uh, damaging or could damage Chinese health, the health of its, of its nationals. And the reason for that is that they insisted on clinical trial data being run uh, only in China for the Chinese market. So uh, again, uh, this is new law, um, January 2018, technical guidance for the acceptance of overseas clinical trial data and medical devices. July 2018, technical guidance for the acceptance of drugs. April 2018, implementing measures for the protection of trial data and drugs. So all of that is relatively new law and what's come out uh, is that um, China has accepted that the trial data can be taken from uh, outside, China, uh, outside China, but they will require, if there is to be given any protection, that that trial data is applied locally. Um, that that uh, the, the application to 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 um, uh, Chinese patients is tested. And you will see on the slide there that uh, if you get it right and if you make China uh, a key part of your uh, marketing uh, for, for uh, your worldwide release, then uh, you can get uh, data protection or data exclusivity, I mean, 
um, for six years or 12 years for innovative biological products for curative use. Due diligence. Well, I think you would have heard uh, from what I've said that due diligence and finding the right local agent and partner is going to be um, a key part of getting this right. Um, the problem of trust is what I call the taxi problem. Uh, when you arrive at a Chinese airport, you're greeted by all sorts of people who are offering you lifts. You've got no idea which of those people are genuine. Um, and in fact, what you end up doing is you entrust your life to a complete stranger. So that illustrates to me exactly the problem here. You need someone to point the way. And uh, you need to tread carefully. You need to make sure you don't take shortcuts. You need to protect before you go, as Graham's slides illustrate, and you need to make sure, you're, make sure you have all the right papers. The Chinese have a great respect for detail and take a black and white approach to getting it right. So the CBBC is not just for reports, but is a door opener and introducer to others facing the same issues. And if you get it right, I think the, um, the PR consequences within China can be very good indeed. Um, especially if you're bringing in new technology, uh, they will greet you with open arms. And if you get the right government backing for that, then um, it will really open doors. Um, so a bit more detail, use CBBC to help with market reports. Um, that has been very useful for us going into China, um, looking for partners. Uh, similarly, uh, you can get CBBC to help you with due diligence reports once you've identified potential partners. And they will open doors to embassy contacts. Again, the embassies tend to be overlooked by um, UK business, uh, certainly private sector business, but they are there and very helpful and very connected. Finally, how can we help? Well, uh, we've got a lot of experience working in China over six or so years. Uh, we have a network in China of lawyers, accountants, government uh, officials and embassies. Um, we understand and know the rule of law and uh, that counts and sometimes it's all you've got left. Uh, we understand it from both sides. We can work with Chinese style contracts to make things happen. And uh, more specifically, we have just uh, developed a non-disclosure, non-use, non-circumvention agreement for you, and we are willing to make that available for free to anybody who would like to, um, to use it. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. I will now hand back to Jamie. Paul, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, I think you will all be able to see my screen now. Um, I would like to thank both of our expert speakers this morning, both Paul and Graham very much for their very detailed analysis on what are the prudent steps that organisations should be taking within this particular sector. I have got a couple of questions here. Um, well, actually, Paul, the free NNN agreement that you mentioned uh, is that you are able to share with me and in turn I can share it with those that are attending today's webinar. Yes, that's absolutely fine. I'll send it on to you. We're just putting the final touches to it, so it will be with you either later today or tomorrow. And it comes with a, a guidance as well. Thank you, Paul. Uh, it's fantastic that pretty much everybody has stayed on this webinar right until the end. Um, we are still just getting some uh, some inquiries through through some.
or having the NNN. So everybody that's attended this webinar this morning, I would like to say thank you very much. I appreciate how busy we all are. I will be sending next week a copy of this presentation and the associated slides. Uh, if any of you want to get in touch in the meantime, please feel free to do so. My email address is there uh, and my contact number. Um, yeah, that's 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 a good question. Uh, Paul, on the on the NNN agreement, how valuable do you think a template template agreement can be or does everything have to be bespoke? It's a useful starting point, but I think um, it must be applied to the particular circumstances. It will give you 80% um, of what you need, but that last 20% is obviously going to be critical to making sure it is enforceable. Yeah, ab absolutely. The we we certainly know that on the FCO website there is a uh, an, an NDA template uh, for UK companies embarking on research projects in China, uh, and I know that a lot of organisations have used this downloadable template uh, from from the internet. Certainly, what Paul will be providing will be far more thorough and tighter than that particular uh, NDA. This will be an NNN agreement, but absolutely this is, uh, this is, this is a template um, and certainly to be uh, ensuring that your, your business with China is as watertight as possible. We, we, we strongly, strongly encourage all organizations to be engaging with, with the likes of Paul or Graham uh, on, on, on ensuring they are taking the right, the right steps. Um, I'm going to be closing this webinar shortly. If anybody did have any questions, uh, please feel free. Please feel free. Sorry to fire them through. If not, we can follow up over uh, we over over email. Um, so on that point, again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining this morning, this afternoon in China. If you're still online, appreciate it. it's nearly time to go home. So I would like to thank everybody uh, for your participation. And we look forward to engaging with you um, in, uh, in, in, in due course. So thank you all very much.